going to quote from your book, Washington's Crossing. Um, you you uh, wrote, for men on both sides, the war was not primarily a conflict of power or interest. It was a clash of principles in which they deeply believed. So um, you're referring both to the American side and the, and the uh, British side. Uh, can, you, can you discuss with what those differing principles were? Yes, it, the heart of it for the, uh, for the Americans uh, uh, was some liberty and, and freedom. Uh, there were other uh, principles as well. They uh, believed deeply in the rule of law and uh, all of those ideas became engaged on a daily basis with the events that followed. Uh, uh, I think one of the most extraordinary parts of this saga was that uh, George Washington and the men in his army uh, joined the values of the revolution in the conduct of the war uh, that's what they were doing there, and it was fundamental to the outcome. To uh, follow up on, on, on that theme, uh, and uh, f taking a quotation of yours from, from Paul Revere's ride, you described the deep commitment that Paul Revere had and his fellow New Englanders uh, for the common cause of liberty, uh, which you just referred to. And I, I found it especially interesting to read your comment in that book, I'll quote from your book, they did not think of that cause as we do today, as the beginning of a new era. Rather, they, they believed they were defending inherited folk rights. Could you discuss that? A bit? Yes, I, I was thinking of uh, one of them in particular. His name was Captain Preston. And uh, long after the Revolution, uh, when he, it, it was uh, after the year 1840, uh, he was interviewed by a historian, and uh, the historian said, uh, Captain Preston, why did you uh, take up arms uh, uh, in the Concord fight? Uh, and he said, had you been reading uh, Locke and Harrington on, on liberty? And uh, Captain Preston said, I never heard of those men. Uh, the, the historian tried again, and he said, was it because of, of uh, the, the tea? He said, uh, he said, I never saw a drop of tea. He said, the boys threw it all overboard. Uh, he said, well, then what was the matter? Why were you uh, fighting that day? And he said, we were doing that because we'd always been free and, the, and, and we always meant to. And the British uh, said, uh, we, we couldn't. He was thinking of fighting for a kind of basic condition of his life. Uh, that he and his ancestors had grown up with. So they were used to a certain style of freedom. They were. And uh, they felt it was being taken away? They thought, they thought that it was challenged. They thought that the innovations were coming um, uh, from, the, uh, from the other side. But then as they got into it, and after independence, they began to think again. And uh, they adopted phrases like the phrase that we carry in our wallets today, novus ordo seculorum, on our, our money, a new order of the ages. Uh, and it, uh, they really began to think that maybe we are reaching towards something new by defending these old ways. Mm -hmm. But then uh, uh, General Washington's dilemma was that he had to lead an army of cantankerous Yankees and Yorkers and Virginians, very much like Captain Preston. And he found that to be extremely difficult. When he came up to Massachusetts and met his army, he, he had an intimation even before he did that, that this was not going to be an easy task. And he, when he was chosen uh, to be the commander in chief, he turned to Patrick Henry and said, depend, on, depend upon it, Mr. Henry, from this day you may date the ruin of my reputation. <laughs> And uh, up he came, and he um, uh, uh, perceived uh, New England, and I think New York, to be almost a foreign country. Uh, he thought that New, New Englanders, in particular, had a, what he called a leveling spirit. He came from one of the most hierarchical parts of, of, of America. Uh, and um, uh, he uh, uh, found that his hierarchical ways that he'd learned soldiering with the British in the French and Indian War did not work well on this, on this army. And he wrote in wearily to his family at home, he said, a people unaccustomed to restraint cannot be drove, they must be led. 
Uh, and the, the, what he was searching for from that moment on to the end of the war in 1781 was a way of leading these free men. And he had to do it by persuasion. And part of the persuasion was about linking those values of the revolution to the conduct of the war. And that was ha what began to happen here in New England. And it kept on, it was happening at Dobbs Ferry in 1781 also worked out an understanding in 1776 that uh, he believed deeply that um, the Congress and the Army had to get on. And he went a way that was very different from every other major revolutionary leader in modern history, uh, very different from Cromwell uh, or from Napoleon. And that what he did was to enter into an agreement, it was Nathaniel Green who was the go-between, that the Congress would be the supreme authority in the country actually subordinate to the people, but they, they, were the, they, they represented the sovereign people. But the generals would manage the war. And it was a very difficult uh, understanding to, to, but he worked, a large part of what he was doing was maintaining what he thought was the rule of law, a kind of legitimacy in this effort that was fundamental to the, to the outcome. And I think the source of the great respect that people began to form for this man in such a situation. He could have made himself king, but he went a different way. Um, during the Revolutionary War, Abigail Adams uh, wrote, wrote this, I think it's a rather famous quotation of hers. She said, posterity, who are to reap the blessings, will scarcely be able to conceive the hardships and sufferings of their ancestors. That's a fascinating passage. And it reminds us of the distance between their thinking and our own in quite a number of ways. The first difference is that she was thinking about posterity. And John Adams, her husband, often said that he was thinking in terms of 200 years at a minimum. And we tend not to operate that way. That's one a difference. The other is that they were thinking not only in terms of rights, liberty and freedom were not only about rights, they were also about responsibilities. And that was critical to, 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 those, to, the, to the Americans and, uh, and very much in the forefront of their minds. We keenly remember our rights and maybe don't so keenly uh, think of some of our uh, responsibilities. And also they didn't have the same sense of um, absorption in their own individual purposes as perhaps uh, uh, some people do today. It was thinking in a more collective way about their purposes and about how they went about achieving them. And I think in all of these ways, we have something to remember there and something that we can combined with our sense of individualism and of individual liberty and freedom, which we all deeply believe in. But it's a kind of balancing act, and they can help us to find that balance in our time. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Appreciate uh, your comments very much. It's a pleasure to be with you.